I started work on this novel in 2008 when I was a graduate student at Hunter College working on my MFA. I was privileged to be able to study with some of the most talented, driven, and important writers working today, among them Peter Carey, Nathan Englander, and Colin McCann, whose new novel, Transatlantic, launched over here this week. We'll pick it up. Um, I've known Colin for some time now. I never say I'm not a name dropper. Uh, we met almost 10 years ago when I was an undergraduate at Baruch College, and he was a visiting lecturer at the school's Sidney Harmon Writers in Residence program. I was enrolled in his fiction workshop. For me, Colin McCann was my first window, window into the life and mindset of a living, breathing writer. Dynamic, intelligent, charming, <coughs> but above all, he was passionate about the work of telling stories. I remember one evening near the end of the semester when he pulled me aside after class. He said, I don't want to fuck up your life, but I think you should keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. And now, 10 years later, I get to be here in front of you. And I want to start this evening with a short passage. Uh, I haven't read this in public before, uh, but for me, I think it highlights what I think fiction is. On the train out of town, he got hooked for freight hopping. The railroad bulls came down with their fists and boots and clubs. He thought he heard his nose break. There was a crunch and his head filled with salt and iron. Not so beautiful, one of them said. And his body was a rag doll tumbling out of the car. The ground was hard and loveless. Behind his eyelids there was a sun, warm and red. He spat strings of black into the dust. He listened to the bulls gather the crackle of grit under their soles. He kicked them. They kicked him a while, burying their toes into his ribs. He kept his eyes shut and tried now to yell. And when they'd finished, they carried him to their car and drove. A bag went over his head. Yes. A bag went over his head, and he could smell his own damp breath blowing back against him. It was sour and foul, like something had rotted in his mouth. The car ride seemed to go forever. The men were talking, but he couldn't make out their words over the thumping of his pulse. His throat had tightened, and he gagged on his own fluid. He thought of <coughs> the confusion that they'd gotten the noose around him. And he realized it was just a devil around his neck. He'd been pulling hard on the loop of twine. When the car stopped, someone lifted him up by his arm and stood him to his feet. This'll do, he said. They pulled the bag from his head. There was so much light, he thought his eyes might crack. His knees started to crumbling. Please, he said. And someone said something, a word of warning maybe. Then a bright, warm pain opened in the side of his head, and then he was gone. When he awoke, the grass was tattooed to his cheek. He sat up. His skull was crowded with pain. In the upper sky, he could see the first splatter of starlight descending down, then the low violet bands, the sun set behind the western hills. He was in a field, unmarked, save for a small creek a few yards down, burbling along the yellow grasses. How long had he been unconscious? Hours, days, years? He touched the side of his head, and blood was still sticky. He pushed against the pain and stood himself up. Then he moved slowly toward the water. Grasshoppers grazed past him, their wings grinding through the air. He sat down on a rock and listened to the blood clicking in his septum. The air was starting to cool. The pain eased into a dull, humming ache. He leaned out over the water and washed the blood from his face. Then he anchored <coughs> his mouth with the stream and swallowed. It hurt going down, but he drank again, sucking the inky cold water, drawing it in. His heart was beating. He was alive. He was still alive. Above him, there was the ancient sky, yoking back the heavens, still holding. His eyes started to well. He could not stop thinking about his brother. Once, they had fought. He forgot about blood. And bloodied each other's faces. His mama pulled them apart and lashed them three times each across their legs with a hickory stick. Look at him, she said to Billy. That's your brother. Look at him. That's your nose you broke. That's your face you scratched up. Now, with this memory dislodged, they rushed up one after another, unconnected. Memories they had forgotten or only half remembered, each one vivid and new with the sharpness of a photograph. Digging for worms in the woods behind the Brooklyn farm, 
the blue light of morning around him, bolting up in a dark room and hearing the fury of his brother's hands moving under the covers. It was Billy who taught him how to climb, not just trees, but everything. The sides of barns, telegraph poles. Never know when you need to get away quick, his brother had said. And they did push-ups together every day for six months. They stood up on two toes on the edge of their father's new car, <coughs> but they were each individually shouted down. They put spoons between their teeth and on each bowl an egg as they scaled up and down the burrow behind the house. And he remembered the day his brother was brought home. His lips were blue, the tongue lolled in his mouth, a dark blue crescent stained his neck. They wrapped him in white cotton and laid him out on the cooling board. His mama had not understood. It was because they shared this skin that they brutalized each other. They cut and bruised and bloodied and humiliated each other to know themselves to see this range of ourselves. <clears throat> to know the range of ourselves. In some ways we write, we write to know the range of ourselves, to understand who we are, what we want to be, and what we are afraid of becoming. For the brothers, their violence against each other was an act of empathy. And for me, I, I try to achieve that same empathy through fiction. The question I am asked the most, the question that more than half of you here are thinking right now is, how does someone like me, someone who is from where I'm from, who looks the way I look, who talks the way I talk, how does this person write a book about the South, about black people, about the poor? The short answer is, <coughs> I don't. How can I? There are as many perspectives on the South as there are citizens of the South. As many experiences in racehood as there are members of a race. Where would one begin? It would take more than one book, more than a lifetime of writing books, to even start. For me, this book is about something else. It's about something more. It's about family. It's about home. It's about loss. It's about trying to feel secure in a world that can vanish in a moment. And that's the story I wanted to tell. Novelists have been doing the work of imagining, of building worlds with their words for ages. Why does this practice seem unique now? Why here? The great work of fiction has always been to, in the words of Colin McCann, inhabit the other. To see and feel and taste and touch beyond the reach of our own experience. From the man sitting next to you, to the woman down the street, across the city, the country, across oceans, across time and space, across the real, the fictitious, the never happened, and the always will. We tell stories because, God love us, there's an abiding need to understand who we are, who I am, and who all of you are. I want to share one last section with you tonight. It's my personal favorite section. I hope you like it. And I hope it'll convey some idea of what I mean about fiction and empathy. I'm also going to awkwardly, oh, here it is. <laughs> when we were young, I called you my Edda. When we went down to the cotton fields without our clothes falling on each other and laughing in full of young breath. And you said what you loved was my arms, how big they were how they could wrap you up and hold you in like a little pea inside its pod. So I told you and we'd look up at the sky almost like we was daring it to rain. We had years together. <coughs> we had years when it was just you and me and we lived only for that warm thrumming inside each other with no worry for what was coming or what had passed. We were outside of everything. And time finally came and we married. I moved us down to Issaquena where the soil was good for timber and chattels both to set down roots. Those early days I'd come home bone tired from hauling timber and you'd be waiting with the dinner all hot and the air inside that little cabin so goodly warm. There was something. Even then, I saw that wasn't right. Something in your eyes and the faraway look that you got sometimes. I remember the night we had Billy. You were in with the midwife while I was outside, my gut in my throat. I was on the porch looking out into the dark evening. It was summer and there were fireflies all around and crickets going and everything singing out the great mystery of the world. And then there was me. My feet turned to iron, the rest of me just reed, brittle, and terrified. 
There was so much in this world, and I did not know if I could measure up. The midwife came and fetched me, and I saw you lying there, tired but glowing, and she gave me this bloody, mewling thing. You are so small. I was afraid to take it, afraid that it might break somehow. But you looked at me, Maeda, and you said, Ellis, hold your boy. The midwife put the thing in my arms, and I knew then it was mine. I could hold up its small weight, and I would exhaust every last drop of my blood to keep us safe. We named him William Cornelius for my father, but around us he was just Billy. We worried ourselves sick. Every cry and whimper and gibbering noise would steal away our attention and fray our nerves. We would stay up nights, made raw, listening to our little new thing kick and whine. In time, our boy grew up. The hair came in full and black, and his face was strong and handsome. We doted on him, Etta, called him your brave boy. You'd see him jump into the bushes and wrangle king snakes and racers, and you'd say, my, how that boy's full of sand. But I knew my boy, how proud he was. And you wouldn't believe me then, Etta. But when those snakes came out of their bushes, he was as afraid as we were. He was just smothered down, never letting on. There were days I'd drive out with my partner Skinny on the mule cart, hauling our load over to the mill. And there'd be something in the air, maybe. <coughs> some smell of magnolia or the look of a shadow on the road. And I would feel a change, I'd feel it right in my body. And I knew I was no longer the person I was. What I mean is, what I mean is so much of my life has been spent as one man, as one person. And now I was more than that. And I could feel it right then. I actually feel myself stretching out. Feel my fingertips spanning outward until I was like a sail, flagged out against the wind, covering you and me and our little boy, and I'd have no memory of who I was before. There was no fear in it, and no regret, just a very real anxiousness to see our future. And in that future came our little Robert. Robert was so much like you, so quiet, full of seriousness. He'd sit alone for long hours, his thoughts zippered up inside him. He never smiled or saw the tension except from his brother, who he'd shadow dutifully all around the house. And our oldest boy took his role as a brother seriously. He would protect him, his small, trembling bloodkin, in a way that not me nor you ever could. When we would look at Robert and only see our little boy, Billy could see another person. You're right, Jane? Sorry to break that dream for you. Uh, Where we would look at Robert and only see our little boy, Billy could see another person, someone, could, someone who could be his equal. Billy would take pains to coax his brother out of himself. He'd play with him roughly, teach him to cuss, include him in that gang of young toughs that romped around the backwoods. And maybe that was what I had begun to fear, that Robert would be too much like his brother, too wild, too smart, too cunning. God, it works up a sting to think this, to say this, some part of me knew how my son would die. I could feel it like a needle inside my heart when first I saw my baby boy kick in his father's arms. I was helpless against Billy's growing recklessness. Couldn't tamp it down with words or whooping. And as the years passed, he became tall and manly, with hair on his chin and heat in the blood. We argued often until finally one day he left us. He tore me up, same as you. And many a time I catch you staring out the window or through the front passage, out into the world while in the middle of some mending or sorting of peas. I would come behind you and, my, and put my arms around your smooth waist, hug you close, and such a terrible look would come across your face as if you were waking from some dream. And for a time you hated me. We would lie apart from each other, the bed cold between us, not touching. Which was fine, I suppose. I did not press you, I didn't force myself on you. At times when the loneliness was raging inside me, I would climb from the bed and sit down in the front room and watch the night. Then the day came, they brought our boy home. Me and you stood outside the house and watched the wagon come up the road. Before we'd even seen who they were towing, you sensed it. 
I took your hand and you squeezed into mine, hard. Something went loose and stringy inside my gut. The cart slowed down out in front of the house and the driver, who was red-faced and dust-covered, took out a kerchief to wipe himself. He was a white man and he looked a little embarrassed for his cargo. Right in the back were two boys. I told you to wait inside, but you came down with me to the road. The two boys in the back carried down the load and they'd set him on the carry cart wrapped in two sheets and packed under with ice. You let out a horrible cry and threw yourself against the body, sobbing. I saw that bruised, purple-looking thing and I couldn't match that bloated thing to our son. The tongue hung out of his mouth, the neck chafed, torn, the eyes not close, they were dull and far away, and looking at nothing. The same eyes that I would find you gazing out from in the coming days. She followed her oldest boy into the dark. I pulled you to me, my pee, and let you heave and sob against my chest, your skin against me. It had been so long, I had forgotten that warmth. I walked you back into the house where you grabbed that little Robert who stared bewildered and afraid as his mama clutched and cried against him. The boys offered their condolences. They said they knew Billy and that they were friends from Nearsville. And one of them was a skinny, asthmatic boy. They were later that he was the one who snuck over after the riders had left and cut the rope from Billy's neck. Even the drivers who looked uncertain of himself around us climbed down from his bench and offered up his hands to me before he took off down the road. I invited Billy's friends to stay that night, and they obliged me. We had fled to the other room and would not come out, so I put the dinner together myself. The first I'd ever cooked, burnt rice and tasteless boiled greens. So they waited, their faces bent over their steaming plates, and heard you in the other room, crying. No one spoke, no one looked at each other. In the hours before dawn, we worked fast to put the body under the ground. I suppose some part of me thought that if I could get him under, if I could hide him away, it would soften our grief somehow. We took him out to the edge of the back track behind the house where you and Robert couldn't see. We dug by lantern, and by first light we laid him under without coffin or blessing in a dirt mound. When we had finished, we walked back to the house with our shovels, arms weary, backs spiked with pain. My head buzzed from want of sleep, and offered to let the boy stay another day, but they refused. I went inside and you were asleep. I lay down, my thoughts empty and useless, and found my way into dreaming. And when I woke up, little Robert was looking down at me. He looked startled when he saw me. He jumped away and stopped himself in the doorway. I sat up and I looked at him. I was burning with shame. Robert, I said. Then suddenly he took a step forward and I put my arms around him. I cupped his small head in my big hands, held him close, smelling of earth. And we, each of us, were rough and awkward in our grief. Little Robert I worried over the most. Outwardly, he wasn't much changed, but inside I saw storms. He didn't cry, but to everyone and everything, he cast a dark eye. <coughs> to me, his solitude became frightening. He no longer came to us for comfort and protection. I suppose he had figured that we were not much good for it. In those early weeks, you would not let him from your sight. You held on to him, would sleep with him tucked hard against your chest. It seemed to soothe you some, but the smallest reminder of his brother would send you into violent spasms of grief. You cried every day, cursing God and me and your damned life, and you tore your hair and beat the walls with your fists. Your rage was something larger than you could handle. It wore you out. Reached the black from your hair, pressed hard, cruel lines about your eyes and cheeks. Then one day, it was over. You stopped crying, stopped talking, stopped doing much of anything, and we were just shades. It wasn't long after that that the great flood came, and though you saw those waters as judgment from on high, I could not find the same solace. Our family was broken. And I knew my part in his breaking. There is one man, a, a preacher, that sniffs around these parts, skimming up the poor souls. After days of trying, he managed to cut me down. He covered me with his little black book and said that I was aggrieved, my son lost and my wife ill, 
that if any soul needed comfort, it would be mine. So the Lord was here to lighten my load if I was willing to let him. And he opened up that book and read some of I don't know what, and he said that God made man for living and dying both, and that all that happens is part of the Lord's plan for me. And that we may all be rejoined in the kingdom of heaven, and on and on and on. I told him that I surely wish that were true, but I am not a man for tall tales. My life is over. It begins and ends in the same place where the past will keep happening. Now it's you and me again, Hedda. There are days when I am here beside you, holding your hand, and a great lonesomeness falls upon me. But then there are those brief, stolen moments where you look on me with such kindness. Not love, but kindness. And in my mind's eye, I can still see that cotton field of bodies across each other, the scent of sweet clover in our lungs, and the grief becomes too much. I look on you, and I'm the one who has been left behind. Sometimes I can glimpse the world in which you live. It's a place better than this one, where our sons still live, and we are young, and your husband is a better man, strong, assured of himself, and not this damn fool beside you holding out his nigger heart. unsolicited advice, uh, especially for those of you starting out. Those of you who aren't starting out probably already know me, so you've already heard all my bullshit. <laughs> um, I want to say to you that fiction is important, that stories are important. I don't want to fuck up your life, but give your story the courage it deserves. Thank you. Thank you.